over 10 years now. And this technology has developed within those 10 years. And now we're looking at how can we utilize blockchain technology to redefine the way that we look at our environment and how can we use it to um, really create new ways of adapting and mitigating to climate change? How do we create um, food security for those who are most impacted? How many people have heard the term environmental justice before? About half the room, right? Anybody want to give me a quick definition? Nobody. All right. This guy, this brother in the hat right here. You a winner. Okay. Let's say there's bad pollution in a certain city, and it's only in this corner of the city where a lot of people of color are, but on this side of the city, there's a lack of pollution. Whatever factors that is, let's say there's a big plant right there near this, the ghetto, whatever, as opposed to down a nicer, higher income area, there's no, there's not as much factories there where there's more pollution. That's like, is that like, that's like a form of it. Could you yeah. say? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I saw this brother's hand real quick. In the blue. Um, Niger Delta region, shale, uh, oil, government being, um, what, 10, 15, 20, 30 years later, now they're getting repartation, repartation for those environmental mm -hmm. crimes, oil in the water, mm -hmm. the, um, food table, mm -hmm. agriculture, water, uh, fishing, they're disrupting their way of life. Wonderful, wonderful. So basically, people of color and or low income are disproportionately impacted by environmental toxins, whether that's a power plant in our neighborhood, whether that's access to clean and healthy water, whether that's access to clean and healthy food. On an international scale, a lot of times, what we like to call, some people call them developing nations. I personally like to call them formally, com formally colonized nations. Um, so that we recognize that these places uh, were already developed and then someone came and took a lot of their resources and now we're coming back from that. So when we're talking about that, a lot of those resources are used up by these colonizing entities that come in. And then what happens is the people who live and feel the brunt of the toxic pollution from a shell oil company or from a dam those are people who look like us, brown and black people. But these people on this panel have solutions that are really going to change our future. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. How do you see the work that you do changing the world? And we're going to start with this young lady here. So what gets me riled up is food security. So when we talk about food security, I'm going to get some annoying numbers out of the way. We talk about utilization rates, right? So when you talk about the average farm, um, on the continent, which is the breadbasket of the world, you say that most farmers, I think we're at a 10 or 11% utilization rate. That's terrible. So just with the land that we have, the existing land that these farmers have, they don't have the capacity to till the land. They don't have the labor nor the access to the capital, which I alluded to earlier, to till that land. So when you talk about food security, you know, we don't have food, we don't, we don't survive. So having access to till that land, access to labor, um, I sort of mentioned it earlier, and I hate to keep plugging it, but one of the things, um, one of the organizations that I work with, um, it's sort of Uber for tractors, and it's allowing farmers to have the ability to till the land that they have oh. so that they don't lose that land. Because that's what's happening. You're seeing a lot of countries, a lot of people losing the land that they have um, because they don't have the access to utilize it. So if we were to even get up to 20% utilization rate on these you know, farms, we would have countries that are self-sustainable. Now, we're not even talking about 40%, 50% um, utilization rate. So um, that'll be where I start talking about food security. And I'll hand off. I don't want to monopolize the mic. <laughs> All right, um, my, name is, my name is Justin Redrick. And uh, to be completely honest with you, up until this morning, I really did not have uh, a thought behind how the blockchain could, could secure food. Uh, with, with my previous knowledge of knowing what a blockchain is, it deals with digital assets. Uh, food is uh, something that's grown from the earth. But until earlier this morning, talking to a good brother named Troy, 
he was giving me a way to how to look at it from a logistic standpoint to be able to track your food from where it comes from out the out the ground to the grocery store. So say you have a farm, you have a farm, and now I have a grocery store, and all of your food has a QR code attached to it. Mm. So we can now track it to see if it's going to some chemical plant before it comes to my grocery store or if it's just coming straight here. And that's possibly the only way that I can see any type of food security given to the blockchain. And I think Kenya, to piggyback on that, I'm not, I'm not sure if someone else would have uh, more information on this, but I'm pretty sure that Kenya has recently signed um, or they're working on a project to track organic food. They wanna be able to, you know, people say something's organic and we don't really know if it's organic or not. And so they're, one of the things that they're testing out is tracking just I, that. How can it be organic with no seeds? I don't, I don't know, I live in Kenya, my food has seeds in it, <laughs> so. Hey, thank you. I don't know. <laughs> Let's let this gentleman speak. Good afternoon, I'm Keith Townsend and uh, as I respond to your question, um, I'm gonna give you some information, some, some data. Uh, and it's, I think it, it kind of gets to the bottom line issue is, uh, blockchain doesn't exist um, independent of the underlying infrastructure that's necessary for the transactions that are being undertaken with blockchain. So let me read a few things to you and take this in. Try, try to speak directly to the mic. Absolutely. First thing is, hopefully you're familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. There's 17 of those, okay? And they are rolling blockchain through those processes across those various platforms. There's, a, there's an article, Rebuilding the Caribbean for a Resilient and Renewable Future. Blockchain may soon help Puerto Rico keep the lights on. Blockchain mm -hmm. Revolution Series, which is a UN climate mandate. There is a coalition in the Caribbean, Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator, a coalition comprised of 26 countries and more than 40 private and public sector partners. There's also, again, the UN launches new coalition on health, environment, and climate change. The, the EU is significantly involved in blockchain as well, wanting to set up their own separate enterprise. And there are two things I came across recently. One is about a lady in Ghana. I don't know if we've talked about this lady or not. She has a company called UBI Group. And one of the things that she's developing is a blue power energy source, which deals with solar energy and delivering that through the process of her company. And there's another lady, again, this is the Forbes article. There's another lady in uh, Suriname who's developed a solar project with respect to uh, bringing energy resources to undeveloped areas in that country. Uh, the point I'm making is, is that blockchain exists, and if it has any value, it exists because of the underlying enterprises being engaged in. I mean, it's a ledger. It's nothing more than a ledger. You know, it doesn't plant seeds in the ground. It's a, it's a book, it's a, help me out, y'all. Thank you. Record book. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't plant seeds in the ground. It doesn't deliver medical services. It, it doesn't reduce carbon or greenhouse gases. It doesn't do any of that. So the value of the blockchain is directly related to its availability in these transactions. One of the other key elements is this. In 50% of the world, there is no internet access. 50% of the world has no internet access. And where internet access exists, it is often regulated, unaffordable, and restricted. Ask Google about China. Ask Facebook, Google, Twitter, all those five social platforms about how the EU regulates those enterprises. It's different in that country versus the United States and other places in the world. My point is this. The value of blockchain, again, is, is, is consistent with the underlying transactions that take effect. But if you're not investing in infrastructure, microgrids for Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, to address energy consumption and access issues, 
If you're not building renewable plants, I don't need a blockchain. I don't need Bitcoin. Mm. It's of no value. Mm. So hopefully the discussion focuses on the underlying enterprises that need to be addressed in order to meet some of the social policy goals that everyone has an interest in. And I'll say one other thing uh, while I have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> and that is this. It is fundamentally important that there be public-private partnerships because these are capital-intensive undertakings, whether you're talking about food, the environment, energy, health care, they are capital-intensive enterprises. And so you need the private sector engaged in that process. You need NGOs engaged in that process. Because otherwise, you take Puerto Rico, you take the Virgin Islands, you take Ghana, you take any country in the world, it's too expensive to modernize without public-private partnerships. Okay, thank you for that. R real quick, uh, yeah, go ahead. I just wanna comment on um, value. So you mentioned solar power and you mentioned a solar farm. Um, and so the first thing that came to mind was uh, there, there's a project that I've heard about um, in Kenya uh, and there is a similar project that I read about in Thailand um, where they're setting up solar farms and those solar farms are creating value and they're doing that by uh, you, let's say, I'll give you the example of, you've got a solar farm in the, the one in Thailand uh, in a neighborhood that's not so rich, right? They've given these folks mini solar panels. They're taking the value from those solar panels, right? And they're converting those into coins. So now those folks are having access to value. And yes, it's just a ledger, but now someone that didn't have, you know, extra income or income in general, now they've created income from those from those solar panels so there is there is it's not value in the traditional way but it's an asset so i just want to and we're, it, it wouldn't be possible without blockchain so that person in thailand is able to sell that extra energy to um you know their their cousin in singapore so i, I just I'm, yes. so i just want to before we go on because i know y'all are going to dominate this um uh -oh. real <laughs> quick <laughs> but it's very important I want to touch on the idea of public versus private mm -hmm. and public-private partnerships. And I think what you're talking about is also really important. Unfortunately, in some cases, we've seen it where these partnerships, especially um, having private entities come in, can tend to manipulate and um, take away from the people getting the needs that they want. So how can we utilize blockchain to make sure that the people are actually getting the benefit. What does it look like to create fair trade blockchain um, as we're developing these um, other technologies? How can blockchain use? How can we use blockchain to create more sustainable and also just economies across the country and the world, really? So I guess what we just again what I was kind of just alluding to, and it doesn't have to be just solar. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about institutional powers, right, um, versus uh, we've been hearing a reoccurring theme that it's, this is a technology that we can utilize and we can create our own systems. And that's when you talk about bringing power back to the people. Power is, money is power. And, and this is uh, another way for us to utilize our own economics. So I think that that's when you talk about bringing power back to the people, it's through the economics that blockchain can leverage. You mentioned, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. When you speak of giving power to the people, um, basically I'm, I don't know about most in here, but I'm, 100% behind Bitcoin. And when you speak about giving power to the people with the whole point of being able to move money or data that's attached to money across the world as you wish, or even hold that money, will give you that power. Um, as the man said, he said he doesn't see a need for Bitcoin unless you're, he said if you're not growing plants, you don't see a need for Bitcoin. But if you, Say, for instance, you grow your food, you sell your food for Bitcoin, and you attach some type of way to uh, say what this sale was for towards the blockchain, you would then be able to secure who bought it, whom bought it where, or where it went. Um, sometimes certain things might not call for a blockchain, or I might not see how it is there for a blockchain. But most of what deals with the blockchain is a movement of value for anyone in the world to access to. So 
a lot of in a lot of things we notice is we speak about companies that do certain things with blockchains, but to be all realistic, not much has been done to say you have done this yet. Um, the only type of technology I've seen that be 100% on the blockchain has been Bitcoin. So I think sometimes we jump, but we jump our gun, we jump the gun on ourselves to say we can do this, we can do this, but realistically, you have not done it yet. So how can you speak upon certain things? that don't give power or that do give power when they haven't been all the way implemented for like say 10 years as Bitcoin has. Give me an example of a, a really great sorry, I'm sorry, public I gotta hold you right there. I've been directed at, um, my time has um, suddenly come to an end, but we take two questions and we come back to y'all for uh, comments. Okay, go ahead. All right, two questions, two questions, two questions, two questions, two questions. This brother in the LA hat. Oh, you, you gonna direct me? Yep. <laughs> all right. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanted to, I didn't go to the hosting school. You can hold the mic. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask um, um, my man at the end here, as far as creating value, do you think it would be possible uh, to use the heat from Bitcoin mining farms to grow plants um, amongst ourselves or for people who use it? Do you think that would be a viable way to create value? Hmm. I, I'm not familiar with w what you're talking about, but let me address, address the issue of value. The lady mentioned the Thailand solar farm. If the Thailand solar farm doesn't exist, why do I need blockchain? In Let me finish, please. Thank you. I got the mic. I got, I got the we mic. all got a mic. I got the mic. <laughs> and with respect to Bitcoin, neither blockchain nor Bitcoin creates the value the value is in the underlying activity, the construction of the solar facility, okay? The delivery of goods and services to those that need it, the development of processes to enhance farming, to reduce carbon and, and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's what makes the ledger the ledger had value. Uh, all right. and, and one other God thing is then I'll give, I'll give up the mic. Okay. The, the, the other thing is this. Bitcoin is today's euro. That's all it is. Before there was a European Union, there was no euro. You have a euro today because these countries did not want to use the underlying financial systems as the basis for paying for transactions for goods and services. So you don't have the pound, the Deutschmark, the franc, no, 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 the lira, or the you, peso. You, you, you got let me finish. I'm going to let you finish. I'm going to let you finish. But I'm gonna let you finish. One second. But I'll be done in I want to make sure that the question itself was actually answered. Because when we talk about the environmental impact of utilizing all of that internet and all of that all of the energy that comes from using blockchain, is there a way to offset it? Is there someone on this panel that can actually talk about that particular question? This brother in the back with the white shirt, he's, he's question two. You've been two. dying to talk. Yeah. Been dying to talk. So first, it's a matter of semantics. So the blockchain or Bitcoin is not a ledger. Bitcoin is a system. So you have Bitcoin, capital B, which is a ledger, a database, a transportation system, and then on that transportation transportation system rise Bitcoin with the lowercase b, which is the currency. The state has no value, shows that you don't understand, with no offense, of course, the system. <laughs> That's like saying that Citibank's monetary system has no value, or well, uh, Western Union has no value, okay? What the Bitcoin is, and I'm not even pro-Bitcoin, but facts are facts. Bitcoin is a car that drives itself, right? With one tank of gas, I could go all over the world. It goes through every continent, every country, okay? It has its own roads, its own transportation system. So with that car that can go anywhere in the world, with one tank of gas, right? With its own transportation system that owns all the roads, it could go anywhere, would that be worth nothing in the real world? The answer is no. Now, you have speculation that may drive the price of the unit of account, which is the lowercase b for Bitcoin, up above its fundamental value. But to assume or to guess that the fundamental value is not there is misguided. Did I answer that? Okay.
May I respond not, to No, no, you can't respond because you took a lot of time and I love you, but we gotta let this lady no, talk right matters, here. Doesn't it? It, I won't let this lady, because I know we're short on time. No, I'm, I'm confused. No, 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 go I'm gonna ahead. speak for those who don't have a mic. I'm confused. So someone can give us some clarity before we wrap this up. Well, I want, she had a response. Thank you. So there we go. Do you still have a response? That's fine. I, we can move on to the next question. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and go on to the second question. Uh, this brother with the lovely fro right here. I knew he was going to call him. You knew it, right? <laughs> All right, y'all better be watching the football season this year. So my question is real simple. Um, with the connection to physical infrastructure in a blockchain, we already have seen how Akon is doing that in Senegal with Acoin, right? Right. But how do we create more economic vehicles for us to have more of a percentage in power because the majority of the infrastructure that's created, we're not creating it. Right. So how do we build upon actually building infrastructure that our stake is not 10%, 0.5% so that when we create, I mean, look, cryptocurrency like video game money, right? If you have a community that wants it, they're gonna no. go crazy over it in a sense of, like I'm an engineer, we can create our own tokens for engineers. If you're a nurse, you could do it for nurses, but we lack economic vehicles that pretty much make us a, a minority when it comes to economic stake. And that's one of the things Marcus Garvey did when he had his uh, stake in our society. So how can we recreate these vehicles to infiltrate the environmental issues that exist, like water rights and Detroit schools not having no ability to have you know water in the schools? Like how do we then create these uh, vehicles? What suggestions do you guys pose for that? I think that you said, two, there are two things that you said and they're a bit separate, but I'm gonna try and answer them as one. So you're an engineer. If there's a problem that you see, you mentioned uh, uh, water, right? Create the use case and solve the problem. The economics are there. Blockchain is giving you like the, pa the power. If you're an engineer, learn Scala. Create some sort of FinTech solution. It's, it's there, if you have that engineering background, it's, we're at a point in a place right now that if you see a, a problem, you can address it, like create a D app, create a DAP. There's, there's, we are so early on that that's why we're here. We see problems, we're going to address them. We don't need to bring in, uh, you know, the, the greater powers that be. You can create the solution yourself. Get your other friend that's, you know, in your engineering class and you guys create the solution. All right, that's our time for the panel. Give them a round of applause. Okay.